Week five, we are breaking it down. We got a big Monday night game. Down to hell, the X Factor joining us for that. Is there a Bengals helmet, a white one that they sent me out here because the Bengals won last night? Nope. We'll get to it right now. Joining me in a bit, I'm sure he is heated. All things dolphins. Got to ask him about some corners. We got to get to the mayor of Shutdown City. But Sunday Night Football, what a game! Listen, some of these games have not been great. Some of these primetime games, especially. So I was happy to see what went down in division rivalry. Of course, Ravens taking down the Bengals, kind of low scoring, 19 to 17, and it was all about Justin Tucker. He did this. He did the Night King thing. He's so confident, and he should be because he is the greatest we have, people. And it must feel so great to have have a 0.05-ish percent worry and concern if you're a Baltimore fan, a coach, Harbaugh, whoever, that he's not going to win you the game there. The confidence and relief and the ease that must be felt in this fan base is invaluable, especially knowing how important it is right now. Get this, 37 games this season decided by six or fewer points, 26 games decided by three or less the second most such games through NFL history, through the first five weeks ever. So you need these kickers to perform. We see it week in, week out, especially yesterday. So credit to Tucker, credit to who's automatic and unbelievable. I could have shut the TV off, but then I would have missed him talking to Melissa Stark about fresh sod and whatever when he got his moment. Tariko was cracking up. We love to see it, and we love Tucker on the show. Ravens needed a win. They have been under fire this past week, deservedly so, by the way. Big blown leads. 32nd ranked pass defense, but this week they pull it together on the backs of a Marcus Peters, who's an emotional spark making plays out there. Brilliance from Patrick Queen, JPP, and this is a perfect pick me up for Lamar Jackson, who wasn't perfect, but he did come back and lead the game winning drive. They complement the, the, the identity of the Ravens to me in the Lamar Jackson era is his MVP level play complemented and, and with the defense and they pick each other up when they're not doing so great and they win and they haven't been able to pull together in the past couple weeks and they did that last night against a Bengals team that really needed a win too. And now they're two and three, and I left my helmet at home. This is not good. And I just want to say this. I love the Bengals. I support the Bengals. But it is fair to question that goal line sequence at the end of the third quarter. Coach, I'm not a coach, but as a fan, I, I want to know what you were seeing. I don't get it. I personally, I don't know if shovel pass was the way to go. I don't know if I'd dial up a Philly special. Unlikely, because I was watching Mixon, and Mixon looked pretty good, and I'm surprised you didn't run there at least once. Bigger picture, the losses conflate and I think that they deflate, or at least they have the potential to, because if we can take a look here, that is now three losses on the last play of the game. That can get in players and locker room psyche, in their heads. We've seen it with other teams. I, you know, I think that this team has the intestinal fortitude, certainly the leadership at the quarterback position to not fall into that. But we've seen it with the Chargers and the Vikings. We've seen it. So my advice and my what I would love to say to this team that I love so much, don't let that get into your head. That's not fun. So, I, you know, I hope Bengals players see it as I am choosing to see it on this week five post Monday, that they're, they are three plays away from being undefeated with a chance, by the way, to change their luck and maybe some of their play calling for week six. All right, some takeaways on uh, other games from Sunday before we bring in Darius Butler. Gotta give love to a place I used to live that I still wish I lived in New York. The Giants, they take down the Packers 27 to 22, early game in London. Part of why I hate LA, these early games, these international, they awful. Oh, I'm up at 5 a.m., 6 a.m. to take these in. Absolutely, I can't, I can't do it. So the Giants now, exciting, four and one. Despite a beat-up roster, this is why it's so important. They come back from 17-3, a deficit against Aaron Rodgers, who gets cheers from everybody over there in London as he entered the stadium yesterday. They did it with no Kenny Galladay. They did it with no Sterling Shepard, a leader, the veteran in that locker room. No Kadarius Toney. No second-round pick, Wandel Robinson. The whole receiving core marked absent on the attendance sheet, and Brian Dable somehow finds a way to make that work. That's insane. Jones is completing under 80% of passes just under yesterday. Saquon, brilliant, amazing, huge part of it too. He leaves with a shoulder injury and they somehow are able to keep moving the ball. So it wasn't, of course, just the offense. Wink Martindale, we see you, we love you. We know we'll talk to Eric Weddle about him later this week, but he's transformed what was a, 
a bottom defense to a top 10 unit. And they were all over Aaron Rodgers yesterday. They racked up six quarterback hits. They batted down seven passes. And it's, to me, it's Dable. It's all you. It shows coaching. Uh, it shows the importance of it, the change that can be made drastically in an offseason when, uh, you know, the culture changes and the competency of a coach. You saw it with you know, the Rams, and they went on and won a Super Bowl and got to the Super Bowl with Sean McVay when that happened. Dable has that effect, and they're going to be a player. With their schedule coming up in this NFC East, they just are. I know. I know, Marissa. Marissa's wearing your Eagles shirt. We'll, we'll calm down. You're undefeated. You were in Arizona. We'll, we'll get to you. I'm feeling like the wrath of Venom. I said something nice about the Cowboys, too, and I heard, I felt it from you. Uh, listen, even if they didn't have the injuries, it would be a stunning 4 and one start. When you factor in all of that, it is miraculous what they've been able to accomplish. Um, okay, let's go to another game, guys. Let's go to another game. Which one is next, Conrad? Which one do I want to talk about? Oh, the Vikings. They take down Chicago. Chicago had some fight in it, 29-22. But we just have to give them love because they are in first place in the NFC North. I, in my prediction, said they're going to make the playoffs, and I think they might win the division. It wasn't pretty, and they nearly blew a lead, right? They were up 21-3. to But they're in sole possession of first place, and that matters. And it's all because of Kirk Cousins, and I love it because he's now led his third consecutive game-winning drive. Hallelujah, Vikings fans. I believe they are the most down trodden fan base in the NFL if I was to power rank it because they have been through it they have these stunning losses it never works out for them and the story around last year's Viking squad is they couldn't win a close game they had these one possession losses these one score losses and the narrative around Cousins is always that he can't come through in these clutch moments and now the narrative he's rocking chains after these wins it is amazing and of course it's early but we're seeing a rewrite again Coaching change, it matters more than anything. And they're off to their best start now since 2016. Cowboys, really quick, got to get to this. I'm talking a lot, I know. And Darius is like, let me get on the show. I have takes on these shutdown city mayors. Uh, but this was a great game. Uh, 22 to 10 was the score. It was here in LA. Cooper Rush has another victory in place of Dak Prescott. So this now has some legs, this story. And if you've watched the show, you know that I've done everything in my power to avoid this being a storyline. Uh, I wouldn't even talk about it, about Cooper Rush versus Dak Prescott. But then he went ahead and took down the defending champs, and now he's 4-0 as a Cowboy starter, and we are forced to think about it because he has not thrown an interception yet. And, you know, the stats might not wow you. The 4-0 certainly does, but the team's playing at a high level, and we're hearing rumblings of Dak Prescott being held out another week. Huge, massive showdown to Rico Collinsworth, him throwing the pen, the whole thing. That will happen on Sunday night in the NFC East between the Eagles and the Cowboys. And it, I'm getting ahead of this because it's gotten to the point that if Rush wins that game and is then 5-0 and and they take down, cover your ears, earmuffs, Marissa, they, <laughs> they take down an undefeated <laughs> Philly team, I'm sorry, but they can't take Rush out. I agree. They can't. They can't He's on a heater it. right now. They can't. It's not even a heat. I mean, I'm just saying this. It's a very interesting, compelling uh, Jerry Jones situation because we just might hear if, if this happens next week, week six, that, you know, may, there might be a setback with that thumb with Dak Prescott. Jerry could surprise reporters on that radio show and say that may Dak's not yet gripping the ball well enough. Maybe he stubs his toe as an injury to the list, and that timeline for Dak to return gets moved back. It's a very interesting decision to think about. Eagles, Lions, and Bears for them. And on that note, with a fun tweet, let's bring in Darius Butler, uh, somebody who can break down these games. Yes, our resident shutdown city correspondent, Colts, amazing quarter cornerback, uh, Darius, tough to bench a quarterback that's 4 and 0. Tougher to bench a quarterback that makes 40. What do you think? Just stirring the pot, just stirring the pot a little bit. I was I was with you, Kay. Wasn't even entertaining the Dak Cooper Rush conversation, you know, who's the quarterback when Dak comes back? Obviously, that's the franchise guy Dak is. He is the better quarterback, the more talented quarterback. But Marissa mentioned a very important <laughs> word in sports and in gambling, and that's being on the heater. And when you're on a heater, you, 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 you can't that? mess anything up when you're on a heater. The locker room, the players, the coaches. I mean, when you're winning games and you're rolling, especially if they find a way to beat this Eagles team, it's going to be hard to make that change. But I think ultimately they, they will still make it. But five wins in a row, 
four is already impressive. When he got this this job, we just thought, hey, 500, That's just true. keep the boat, you know, just floating. But he's 4-0 and right now. Very, very impressive. And you got to think, when that, when that happened, and Jerry Jones is older and tenured and wants a championship, like, I'm sure he was reaching out to other quarterbacks in the league. I'm sure somebody was trying to find Phillip Rivers' phone number to try to get him there. And now he's, you know, Cooper Rush is absolutely stunned. Uh, I'm a little stunned as well, uh, as well right now. But kind, kind of yes and kind of not. This was the the person we were all looking at, the Carolina Panthers. We've got breaking news here on Up and Adam show. Uh -oh. Darius, they part ways with head coach Matt Rule. You're thoughts on this 11 and 27 in three years with the Panthers yeah not not surprised by this move at all um I honestly was surprised that he uh ended last year and kept his job after last year but now you know it's tough you haven't you haven't been able to hit at the quarterback position you haven't been able to figure that out I thought Baker Mayfield was going to be a good move for them but I mean I think he's bottom of the league right now in quarterback rating he's not playing great Ben McAdoo isn't helping him out much calling the plays so um, you know that's that's the that's the job of the head coach, and I'm sure he'll find a good spot in college. Yeah. But I don't necessarily think Matt Rule was cut out to be a, a great NFL coach, and he didn't get a lot of the pieces that he needed as well. I think so. The I first, think this is yeah. the right move down there in Carolina. And the first thing you said, the first thing you said was quarterback, because that's what Rule was supposed yep. to be. I remember interviewing. Matt Rule, before he even became a quarterback's coach, he was, it was at the draft in Nashville, and he was you know, uh, there supporting his players that were entering the draft. But that's why David Tepper brought him in, because he's supposed to be known as this offensive-minded guy that's going to take a quarterback and get the best out of him. And it, like, the word pathetic, like lackluster, comes to mind like when it comes to what the offense has looked like in his tenure there. Uh, you know, there needs to be a spark to this team. And unfortunately, you know, it starts with him, of course. Um, yeah, for sure. You got to help that quarterback position out as yeah. much as you can. Uh, you just talked about Cooper Rush being able to get wins. You see Daniel Jones and what he's been able to do with uh, Brian Dayball. So the coaches got to be able to help that quarterback out because they definitely have the talent outside of the quarterback. They do. I want to put up another uh, another tweet here from Ian saying the defensive pass game coordinator, secondary coach Steve Wilkes is the new interim. And I, Ooh. I gotta say, I like this because he got what one season when he was out in the desert, right? One season out in Arizona, yep. and then he got fired and replaced with Cliff, so Cliff could re, you know be with Kyler and all of that. So uh, I actually like this. You played in Carolina, right, back in 2011. So what do you make of of uh, how this could work and the spark that Wilkes could add? I mean, I, lo I love this move. Uh, Steve Wilkes is, is familiar with the franchise, familiar with the organization and the team. Uh, my last year in Carolina, um, I was with him in the training camp. So okay. familiar with Steve Wilkes. And like you said, he did get a raw deal in Arizona. Yep. Everyone around the NFL um, knows he did. So I love that he's, that he's getting another opportunity down there in Carolina. And it'll be a, a fresh, you know, usually I, I'm betting on them. Whatever their line is to cover this week, I'm betting on it. Because when you get that interim head coach, somehow, some way the team finds a spark to get it done at least that week. That Passaccia. But um, whoever the head coach, whoever the head coach, that's going to wear that hat full time. They have to get that quarterback position right because without a quarterback, you don't have a chance. Panthers have the Rams. They got a pass rush. So the Panthers have a pass rush. So if you have a pass rush, you got a chance to beat the Rams. If we haven't seen anything else, we've learned that, um, especially in the fourth quarter. The Rams have struggled mightily uh, with that offense to get anything going. But it starts with the protection up front. No, no protection from Matt Stafford. It's so true. And then, yes, I, I said Basaccia because it's the fact like he took over a, what was like a mess on multiple levels on the field, off the yep. field for the Raiders and they played for him. And it adds it does add something. And I'm always here for a rewrite. I am always here for a second chance situation. I think uh, Wilkes did get a raw deal. And uh, mm -hmm. and so I'm sort of rooting for this. And I credit Tepper for making the change now, do you? Because it can't be easy to do this in season, right? It can't be easy to rip that band-aid. You could say like, all right, let's just have a good, dra better draft pick next year and suffer through the year. Uh, but he's making that decision in the before the first half of the season's over. And that's tough. It's always tough to, to make this decision during the season. You don't want all those moving parts, but you are lucky enough to have a guy familiar with the organization that can and, and, and has some head coaching experience with Steve Wilkes. So it is a tough move to make, but like you said, credit to uh, David Tepper for doing it. And it needed to be done, honestly. Like, it was no reason to wait um, because at this point, you know, 
I think you kind of lose the locker room. We're yeah. going out there week in and week out, and we're getting the same results. For whatever reason, we're not getting it done. And this isn't something new to this year. This goes back into last year and the year before. So uh, the change had to be made. So now you get a, a, a good sample size of what you're going to get with Steve True. Wilkes at the head coach position. So now you maybe you continue and go ahead with him. Or maybe you go elsewhere and look. But I, I like this move for the Panthers and for Steve Wilkes. And you have Sean Payton just sitting back there like the first domino has fallen. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> by first. I, and David Tepper would write that check. Make no mistake. He would like, you know, Sean Payton likes that money. So I think that that's an, an interesting, at least a, a candidate for, for a proposal because Listen, based off these coaching decisions I saw yesterday, the seats are heating up around the league because there's some crazy, uh, inexplicable stuff going on. Darius Butler, you're amazing. Don't go anywhere. We're going to talk to you. Uh, we're going to, of course, hit up Shutdown City. We've got to talk about the Bills. we got to talk about all. Oh, and this <laughs> roughing the passer. Uh, woof. That's my word for it. What's yours? <laughs> Back on Up and Adam's show, Adam Schefter says the Panthers fired head coach Matt Rule, who has gone 11 and 27. How did I know that number? I'm so great. We must have a great researcher. Uh, during his three seasons in Carolina, Rule leaves Carolina with four years left on the seven-year contract. Man, four years left that he got from those Panthers and David Tepper back in January 2020, supposed to be known as an offensive quarterback guru kind of guy. It has not worked out. It has been underwhelming, to say the very least, uh, out there in Carolina. Steve Wilkes takes over as interim head coach. Got a raw deal in the desert. He's back, baby. Let's see what he can do. He's got some studs and a young feisty defense. They've got the Rams on the docket for week six. Darius Butler joining us uh, again to talk roughing the passer because we were, <laughs> no, we were robbed of a dramatic finish. I'm an NFL fan, not an analyst or a player, but what'd you make of this? I mean, it was terrible. Absolutely horrible. Obviously, you know, we, we got we got a bad one last week in the Baltimore Buffalo game. Same ref, by the way. Um, it was a bad mm. one against Simmons and the Commanders. <laughs> These calls, I think, should all be reviewed. These roughing the passer calls, like, they're too important. The games are in the balance. This game was in the balance. Falcons never got a chance to answer right here. Third down, you get a sack. I mean, I don't know how else you're supposed to lay Brady down here. Uh, great, great job by Grady Jarrett, but this is a horrible, horrible referee. Uh, is this the worst call of the season? This is the worst I've seen, for sure. Because I was actually watching that one live, and I saw, I was like, oh, okay. Like you said, I'm a fan. I want to see a, a nice, dramatic finish. I'm thinking, okay, Atlanta got a chance here. And I saw roughing, like, I was literally shocked. So I would say, yeah, this is the worst that I've seen. Grady Jarrett has had – he is the, the bright spot on this, on this defense. He is so – such a good player, and, he's, and, and this is how he gets the notoriety for this roughing the pass ball. <laughs> so I hate that for him because I actually think he's a spark and he's somebody that, you know, if, uh, on a national TV show people do not speak about. So uh, it sucked for him. Do you think the Tua plays a part in it at all? Like, does the Tua thing play a factor here with this increase of roughing calls? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. It, it's hard for it to say it, it doesn't. Um, and that's kind of what the, the NFL does. They kind of overreact to some things. You can see it with the protocols, the concussion protocols, the NFL and the NFLPA came together and made some new um, guideline, which I, guidelines, which I think ultimately is good for the game. But this obviously is not. You know, you have to have some judgment there. Yes, he slammed him to the ground. I mean, it's a sack. He had to roll over as well. It's physics. So I think this <laughs> is partly Tua, Tua's head injury is partly responsible for this, but still not a good enough to, excuse to be refereeing, you know, these games. It's, it's a lot on the line. The jobs are on the line, Kay. Jobs yeah. are on the line. We I can't know, have it. Well, you're calling out the ref. His job's on the line, too. He's not getting, hey, he's not we, getting we, that We Super all got to be held accountable. <laughs> <laughs> Same guy last week. You just dropped that in there. I liked that. Uh, riddle me this. How does it change your mindset as a player when you know there's an increase, you know there's a sensitivity in, 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 in your work, like an overcorrection, if you will. Uh, when you go in for a hit or a sack, how does it change your mindset? Are you second guessing? Yeah, it's tough. We saw a player lad, a few years ago on um, the Dolphins. He came in trying to sack the quarterback and was trying to brace the call. This is when they first start calling, kind of slamming the quarterback to the ground. I think he tore his ACL. Um, so you do think about it. I remember when they first changed the target area with the receivers and defenseless receivers when I was playing. It definitely changes your approach, which is tough. You're already playing 1,000 miles an hour. Things are going so fast. And then the ultimate 
win for a defensive lineman is to get a sack. So you actually get there to Brady, who always gets the ball out too quick. And then now you just have to be so meticulous with how you lay him down on the ground. It's almost impossible. <laughs> uh, I really, really hated this call. And another one that just jumped in my mind that was probably worse than this one because it had nothing uh -oh. to do with play. They flagged Chris Jones in the Chiefs-Colts game when they got a stop on a two-minute drive because of something he said to Matt Ryan after getting yes, the stop. So that was bad. referees, <laughs> just stay out of the way. Stay out of the way. Let the players play. If we need you, jump in there. But if not, stay out of the way, please. And number 95 on the Chiefs. God, I love Chris Jones. I just want to know whatever. I need to know what he said in that minute. Uh, listen, you brought up the Dolphins. I didn't. Let that record show. Right? You brought <laughs> up the Dolphins, not me. But let's get into it because they're struggling. It's not really their own fault. There's, you know, the loss of Tua and yesterday the loss of Bridgewater as well. And they fall to the Jets. What was it, like 40-17? Not great. That would tell me as a fan and a host that Tua is very important, that we are almost underscoring the importance of their starting quarterback. What is your takeaway from that? Put him on an MVP watch list after seeing what took place yesterday. Um, obviously, like you said, we didn't get a chance to see um, Teddy Bridgewater and how he was going to operate with this offense with a full, you know, game of a uh, full week of preparation and practice. He got knocked out early on from Sauce Gardner and his uh, sack. But Tua is is critical, obviously, to this offense. And hopefully he's healing up fine and he'll be back in there sooner than later as a Dolphins fan. But when he's 100% okay, but he's super important uh, to this offense. Everything Mike McDaniel had going on with all the motion, the shifting, right. and the quick, accurate passes um, that Tua was killing teams on. So I can't wait to get one back out there as a Dolphins fan. Still sitting at three and two. Hopefully, you know, in the next couple weeks, one can make his return. But uh, shout out to the Jets. You know, Zach Wilson, he's 2-0 on his yes. return. The vibes are high in New York right now. Jets got to win. Giants got to win. One. So they're sitting on top of the world right now in your old uh, stomping grounds. Yes. Do you trust Skylar Thompson to keep it keep it okay here? Because, you know, Mike, Mike McDaniel, it's, a, it's an aggressive. Yeah, okay. No. No, Tell I, me. I don't. I, I don't. I, I want to, you know, as a fan, I'm optimistic. But no, I don't trust Skylar Thompson. You just I win. don't. Now, I'll call Ronnie Brown. Let's see if we get a wildcat going. We need something rolling. We got the <laughs> cheetah. He's in a boot. We got to figure something out and figure something out quick in Miami. But no, I do not trust Skylar Thompson. But maybe have? he can be Bailey Zapp next week. Who knows? He's Oh, and they got, you know who they got next week? Shoot. The Vikings. <laughs> I, I already know Vikings. Vikings. Is it on prime time? Uh, uh, no, don't, we can't. Kirk Cousins is killing it. You cannot prime time Kirk me anymore. I don't think. Yeah, right. I just want to know game. if we have a chance. Kay. I just want to know. Okay, first of all, Conrad's in my ear saying 10 a.m. game. It's a 1 p.m. game. There, no one says 10 a.m. game with this <laughs> L.A. nonsense. Absolutely not. Get no, off it's that an Pacific time. Early, early window game. So we'll see. Oh man, that would have been so nice to have Teddy have a revenge game up against the Vikings. I would have been so in on that. Uh, okay, you know, it's so, I love you. This is why I love you, because I asked you a question about Tua, and you brought up Sauce, Sauce Gardner in your answer. You know, I'm just, you know, I'm a team player here, Kay. No, I'm, you're you know. not. You're a total <laughs> defensive-minded quarterback, and that's why we love you, and we love giving them love on the show. So uh, we want to, first, before we get to Shut Down City, there was this moment that rubbed me the wrong way. Again, as a fan, Jalen Mills. Yeah. Jeff Okuda, this is after the game, and they're helping each other out. Now, oh, what, what were your thoughts? You know, I love to see it. I love <laughs> to see it. Obviously, we are competitors, and we're trying to fight to get a win. But at the same time, we're all pros, and we love, you know, paying it forward and giving some games back. And yeah. um, that's what's going on here with Jalen Mills and Jeff Okuda. We watch film. We see everybody kind of on film. So I'm sure Jalen Mills probably saw something that week. He was like, hey, when I get him, when I get a moment with him, I'm going to give him this little tidbit. And who knows where that can go for Okuda. Well, can, so I love to see this. Can those moments be off of the field, off camp. Like, I'm fine. Like, Von Miller no, wants, to, okay, Von Miller who, wants who, to do his pass rush thing in, in May somewhere. Who, George Kittle wants to do tight end no. university. Mwah, I love it. I love the camaraderie. But, like, I, right let me just say this. Uh, this I'm fine. I, I, I don't mind this. But if this was a, a like somebody that they face twice a year, if I'm a fan, I don't need to. I've seen that before. I, I mean, too. Pass rushers do it all the time. I don't need to see your your swing moves. <laughs> like I don't need to see. I don't need to see any of it on the field as a fan. Uh, were you ever approached by a, a veteran player or just another player, and did, did you learn something from them on field? 
Oh yeah, I, I would I would always watch the guys. I would watch guys on film, but uh, one guy, um, Joe, uh, dang, Jonathan Joseph. You know, we played yeah. the Texans obviously a, a, a ton twice a year, and he was in a Texans long time great cornerback. And we would catch up off after the game a lot, and he would drop some game on me. And I would always pay it forward to the younger guys as well. Really? You always want to do that, Kay. You know, you, you want to do it, even though you may be playing against each other, you see each other, but you want to see that person uh, do it as best they can. I don't like the jersey exchanges either. I don't like the jersey exchanges. I don't like the jersey exchanges. Come on, okay. What, what's going on here? B- big old, Ben. Old woman yelling at the clouds. Big, yeah, I am. Ah, um, I don't like it. Big Big Ben asking Brady for his jersey. What are we doing? What are we? Send send somebody over to the locker room to do that. May, have you heard of FedEx? Have you heard, like, what, what are we talking about? Listen, like, why are we doing that on the may, field? Hey, we got to have that man-to-man conversation, okay? When I got you in that moment, yeah, dap me we have up. our conversation and we go on. Respect, a dap up, I get it, a hug even, like a whispers in the ear, I love you, man, blah, 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 how's the family, great. And then bounce. <laughs> like, I don't need, like, I don't know, I don't, I don't like it, I like, I like competition. Uh, okay, let's get to Shutdown City. Are we ready for Shutdown City? Ooh, let's do it! Competition. It's, t- it's tough to get in a Shutdown City. Okay! But here we go, Tariq Woolen Woo! out in the Pacific Northwest. This rookie is playing lights out back-to-back weeks. He had a pick six last week, and then we got another one. And this one he had, you don't see a big fella put his foot in the ground and get out of his breaks like he did this uh, game. So shout out to Tariq Woolen. Back in shutdown city, baby. Let's go. What a the game. next what person, season? Jack Jones out there in New England. He is playing light, lights out. He had a pick six. Last week against A-Rod, had another pick against the Detroit Lions this week while doing a shutout. The defense pitched a shutout, and he had a big part of that. So loving his game, the confidence is growing. And now we have a mayor. You always have to have a mayor. The youngest mayor in shutdown city history, Sauce Gardner. You knocked my quarterback out, but I still had to let you in the shutdown city. Had it had a pick, had a PBU, had a sack. He's been playing great all year. And kind of, you know, that that Jets team, they came together and played really, really good as a unit. And Sauce was leading that unit on the other side of DJ. Uh, so I uh, love, love what Sauce is doing. And he is your new mayor of Shutdown City. So congratulations, one. Are these three rookies? Look at you. Um, yeah. These are three rookies. You're paying it forward, Why? like you said. I like it. Bring the young guys in. There we go. Bring me some more of that new money. <laughs> Bring I love that it. new the money Jets to have, the city. The Jets have stud rookies on the other side of the ball. We'll get to that quickly before I let you go. Monday night matchup, Raiders, Chiefs, who you got? I got the Chiefs. You know, the Chiefs, you know what Patrick Mahomes does to this uh, division. I think only three losses in like 25 games. So Patrick Mahomes, especially against the Raiders, uh, Patrick Mahomes, he's cooking. He cooked last week. And you give Andy Reid and Eric bien me that extra day to cook some sauce up, we're going to see some, some fireworks yeah. tonight. So I'm taking the Chiefs by at least a touchdown tonight. They had 10 days to cook up some extra sauce for your Colts and couldn't do it, but maybe against the Raiders in their division. They'll you were telling, okay? Come on. We got the cape bump. <laughs> we had the cape bump. I forgot about the cape bump. You're so right. All right. Sauce mm-hmm. Gardner, the mayor of Shutdown City. Darius Butler taking the, taking the Panthers over the Rams week six. You know what? I wouldn't say to win. I got to see right. what the line All is. Right. I got to right. see what the FanDuel Sportsbook line is. I'm not taking it. I'm not saying it yet. <laughs> Company man, Darius Butler, you're the best. Talk to you in a bit. We're talking Chiefs and Raiders with Dante Hall. He'll be on the show in a little bit. Uh, we got to get to the bad stuff, like the Packers and the Steelers. Oof, all next. Everyday wins make your day so much better. Duh. That's why FanDuel Casino has the new daily free-to-play game. It's called Reward Machine. Doesn't that sound nice? And it's free. It's a game that gives players the chance to win up to $2,000 in casino bonus every day. All you have to do is log in daily and spin for a free chance at rewards. FanDuel wants you to win. Play Reward Machine for a free chance at everyday wins only on FanDuel Casino. Wild Week 5. Dante Hall joining us in just a little bit. We've got one game to go in the AFC West tonight. But uh, some of the other storylines and some of the games, uh, let's hit some takeaways for them. we got to start with the Pittsburgh Steelers who got lit up in Buffalo to the tune of 38 to 3 and then this happened. Would you be looking at replacing possible starters on defense? A- absolutely, man. You play like we played today, mm-hmm. man. You got to be open to doing whatever is required to change the, the outcome of these games. And so that's a given. Um, I don't think anybody's going to be surprised by our willingness to turn over whatever stone to change the outcome of games like transpired today. That's just appropriate. 
I don't like to dig into coach's sound at the podium after such a bad loss. It's an emotional response. It always is. Um, but what we're seeing is fascinating in a bad way. It's like bizarro Steelers, right? There's, there's a Mike Tomlin streak of 15 straight years without a losing season that is in serious jeopardy here. And I, I've said this before. I don't want to say it again. I said this to Filipponi, who was saying, Andrew Filipponi comes on our show. He's talking, Kenny Pickett, Kenny Pickett. And then he goes, put Trubisky in at the half. Unbelievable. I don't understand the timing of the move to Kenny Pickett. This was not the game to put him out there. It's not a great situation. They threw him to the Wolves against Buffalo yesterday and that pass rush. So I will say it was nice to see he ha him have some fight in him. Like he's got resolve. He absolutely looks like he belongs as a starter in the NFL, but you can't convince me this is good for his long-term development. I've seen too many other quarterbacks get beat up out there, lose confidence out there, and it messes with their development. And I'm not saying that I'm worried about him getting Sam Bradford in, but there's a concern there with the O-line being a mess and the defense falling apart. And now the gravity of it all is that when you make this decision, you can't go back. You can't, t I mean, you can, but you really can't. We all know that you can't. You can't go back to Trubisky. And that's why the decision is so grave. And it's not going to get easier. The Steelers have the Buccaneers with Brady looking as good as he looks up next. All right, next game. And you, I would love your guys' thoughts, of course, at Up and Adam show. Uh, the LA Chargers beating the Browns 30 to 28. Oh my gosh. Okay, so here's what we have to talk about in this one. It's fourth and two minute left on the clock we all saw it we're all seeing it game on the line for the chargers and the guy who we love who we give so much credit to for having the stones to always go for it he decides to go for it on his side of the field so when, when you're looking at this it just doesn't make any sense because they're up by two they're facing a you know they're on their own 46. Wasn't there 46? I think they were. They're on their own 46. Staley decides to go for it. Justin Herbert misfires, and the Browns, you know, they get the ball back, and they're a few yards out of field goal range. And then Cade York missing the kick lets the Chargers off the hook. But it seems like, in my opinion, and they won the game. So you're like, whatever, right? So it's a ripple effect, in my opinion with trust in Staley going forward. And why do I think this? Because there are some rather verbal players on this team, Keenan Allen, WTF are we doing? What are we doing? Here's the problem with this. And he goes, so glad he missed that because man, man, man. They won, it's all fine, but you have guys openly questioning what's going on with the play calling and the decision making. That being said, they're three and two. They still have everything in front of them this season. I still think Justin Herbert can pull off a, a, an MVP conversation if they keep it going. All right, Saints down the Seahawks, 39 to 32. I mean, is this not the most fun offense to watch in the NFL right now? Is that hyperbole? Am I too excited? The Seahawks may not be winning every game, but damn, they're making it entertaining. And I'm so here for all of it, even in a loss. Geno Smith, brilliant. He was our hit the lights player last week. Brilliant again, three touchdowns, no interceptions. He has the NFL's highest passer rating. Uh, and the Seahawks might not be a good team, and they're not a good team because their defense comes up short. But watchability-wise, top three. Top three, seventh highest scoring offense in the NFL. But we're here on the Up and Adam show to give credit to the Saints. Do we have our Saints thing up? Yeah, we got a Saints helmet back there. We have to. They found a way to outscore Seattle without Jameis, without Michael Thomas, and without Olave after he left the game because he got banged up with a concussion. 112 rushing yards and three scores out of Taysom Hill, who just continues to do incredible things for this franchise. Taysom Hill will not be talked about on many shows this morning. We see you, we love you. Saints, keep doing it. All right, last but not least, let's do it. Niners beat the Panthers 37 to 15. Niners now in sole possession of first place in the NFC West after the other three teams in the division all fell, and they've all done it with tons of injuries. Uh, yeah, I guess we can give credit to, to this side. Obviously, we want to tell you guys, if you haven't been watching, Matt Rule has been dismissed.
That's the big news. Steve Wilkes, interim head coach, defensive coordinator, will take over. He's been a head coach, had a one and done uh, year out in the desert before they brought in Cliff Kingsbury because they wanted him to hang out with Kyler. That all makes sense. We all know that. Steve Wilkes now gets a nod. David Tepper and the Panthers decide to part ways with Matt Rule. Four years left on his deal. They do this five weeks into the season. This, of course, the coach. I'm sure FanDuel Sportsbook had some sort of bet on who was seat was the hottest among coaches and he certainly was the one that everybody had on their dartboard going into the season uh, but I will say this as far as the the Niner side of things because that's really what's going on with the Panthers Panthers have the Rams they're going to get that spark Darius Butler did not pick them to win that game but we've seen it happen interim coaches come and take over and it happens uh, the Jimmy G of it all is what's interesting to me listen we don't have a very big staff here on up and Adam show if you can believe it we don't have a control room loaded with people but if we did Please know that I would demand a cut-up edit of all the times that I have tried to tell you and warn you and have defended Jimmy G. I am just that petty. So I will sit here and tell you again that he has continued to get stronger with each passing week. Why? He didn't have a, a, tra a training camp, a preseason, any of that. It was all Trey Lance all the time. 253 yards, two touchdowns for Jimmy, 37 points for the Niners against a talented Panthers defense. One that got Darius Butler's approval. Did he not, Marissa? Yes, he did. The Jimmy Redemption story is shaping up to be compelling, to be the stuff they make movies about, and I'm here for it. Niner, you know, did you know that Stats, Stats who clowns on Jimmy Garoppolo as a career and gets paychecks for doing it, is out there somewhere tweeting about how happy he is about Jimmy Garoppolo's performance? Give me a break. Jimmy G, ride or die. All right, coming up, we have a former Kansas City Chiefs wide receiver. Is he a wide receiver? Is he an offensive weapon? A game changer. Dante Hall joining the show, I think, after this. Back on Up and Adams, Matt Rule signed a seven-year, $62 million contract to become the Panthers coach. He lasted 38 games with the team. That's right, they're parting ways. He's 11-27 and 27 in his three years with the Panthers. Let's bring in now one of the baddest return specialists in the history of the NFL. We'll get his thoughts on this on tonight's game between the Chiefs and the Raiders, of course, the human joystick known as Dante Hall. Hello. Hello, hello, Kay. How are you? I'm great. I like the shirt. I'm always checking out the shirt. Big graphic tea guy, Dante Hall. <laughs> Thank you. I'm in game day mode. And I I'm love here that. In Kansas City. Yep, in Kansas City, and excited. This is my first game in Arrowhead this year, so okay. I'm excited. So do you just do you, do you go get your barbecue on before the game around the parking lots? Like, what's your story? A hundred percent. Well, I actually got my barbecue on yesterday. But uh, sometimes I do go out and tailgate. And uh, I think I'm going to tailgate today because I don't have work today. Wow. So probably, yeah. So I'm going as a complete fan today. That makes me so happy for you. That's incredible. I mean, you're, you're going to be bothered every one step you take <laughs> for pictures. It's, it's, it's love. Who, who looks at receiving love as a negative? So it's all love from the Chiefs yeah. fans. So. Certainly not a wide receiver. They love, they love, they love. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's really exciting, and I love that. We'll talk more, of course, about the Chiefs hosting the Raiders, but uh, there's breaking news this morning, and, and it's been sort of a slow, slow year, I think, when it comes to breaking news and drama. Uh, Matt Rule fired. Our crack research staff, who's incredible, found out during one of these commercial breaks that in 2008, of course, to end your, your career, you were with the Rams. Scott yep. Linehan gets dumped after week four. Same situation, kind of. And Jim Hazlitt takes over. Hazlitt goes 2-10 and ten the rest of the way. So interim coaches, to me, always add a spark. Not always the case. So your thoughts, uh, and we'll just start there, on, on, on the firing and going back to that year and what it was like. Yeah, I was shocked that, um, you know, they fired him just at this point in the season. Um, I understand the Panthers have not gotten off to the start that they wanted, but they also are, you know, infusing a new quarterback. Uh, Matt Rule has only had four weeks to work with, I guess five weeks now to work with Baker. Um, I just felt like he would have more time. And, yes, as you, as you mentioned, I was a part of a coach being fired midseason, and it definitely shakes up any, everything because you start looking around like, who's next? Are players going to be let go? Are other coaches going to be fired? Um, so not sure what happened, what led to him being fired, but it definitely, uh, like you say, it doesn't always make um, a spark for that particular situation. Yeah. So, well, what happened? Wait Take me, what happened there? What happened with when Hazlitt took over and didn't work out? And, and what goes on in the locker room? Like, you know, player, what are players worried about? And why didn't it work in that Rams 08 squad? Well, I answered that question first, the last question. 
we just sucked. We had a bunch of old guys, uh, the great Isaac, uh, Isaac Bruce, Story Hope, you know, the greatest show on turf. It just wasn't the greatest show on turf anymore. So I just think we suck, to be honest. Um, but what Hazlitt did, he went around and he was more of a, a player's coach. He wanted to, you know, hey, what do you guys feel we need to do different? Um, what do you guys think? That was the, what he did. He came in, and maybe because he played. Um, I'm not sure, but that was the difference from Scott Linehan to Jeff Hazlitt. He was more of a player's coach and, you know, hey, what can we do to turn this thing around? But he doesn't have the proper cards to turn it around. Yeah. I was old on my way out. Ike was uh, old, Tory Hope. We had Steven Jackson at the time. Wow. But he was, you know, getting hurt a lot. And I just think we had a really bad team. SJ And maybe that's the case with the Panthers. Is it, though? Because, you know, I don't remember that 08 team that specifically, but it sounds like it was full of veterans, right? And, you know, a younger SJ, 39, out there doing his thing uh, and start struggling with injuries early, of course, and throughout. We put up 1,000-yard seasons, like, every year forever. Uh, but this Panthers team is different. Like, they don't have the Keekleys and the Pep. They don't have that anymore. And then they have a new quarterback, Baker Mayfield. So Steve Wilkes, their defensive coordinator. And they've got a feisty young defense. They do. And they'll, yeah. they'll keep them in games. What kind of a coach do you think they need? And do you think Steve Wilkes, who, of course, had one year under his belt uh, and has a huge opportunity, like, maybe it'll be different. Is there anything positive to glean from this? Uh -huh. I don't think so, and here's why I say that. As you mentioned, the defense is great. But in this league, you need that stud, you need that guy at the quarterback position. And Baker has just proven, this is not my opinion, this is what we've seen with his sample size. He's just not that guy. And I think that's the biggest. And then you got McCaffrey, you know, he's starting to be hurt often as well. Mm -hmm. So you lose a guy. Um, your heart and soul on your offense and McCaffrey to injuries, so he's in and out of the lineup. You don't have that guy on offense. It's just going to put a lot of stress on your defense. So we'll see what this new interim coach does as yeah. far as tweaking some things on offense. Defense is obviously not their problem, so we'll just have to see if this okay, sparks well, the be offense. this then. Riddle me this, because I want to be a little po – not positive, but – in that locker room, you said y'all you were you were older. You were your last. It's, it's it's different in the Panthers locker room. Very younger team. What advice would you give to that locker room? You know, you're saying everyone's questioning who's next, whatever. What advice would you give a young locker room and how to ha how to handle a coaching change going into week six of the season? That's a, that's a great question. Um, Al Sanders, who was my offensive coordinator when I was with the Chiefs, he had one of the best sayings ever: "Form your own field." mean you worry about you and what you have to do. So if you're a receiver, be the best receiver you can be. If you're a defensive guy, you can't worry about what's going on on offense. You can't worry about the D-line. You can't worry about um, anything other than what you're doing. Because if everyone hmm. elevates their game, then the team elevates. Form your own field would be my advice. Well said from Dante Hall. Now, you're there in Kansas City. You're wearing the Arrowhead shirt in case anybody didn't, didn't know where you were. <laughs> Just to make sure everyone's well aware. And it's a big showdown tonight. It wraps up week five. It's exciting. It's the Chiefs and the Raiders. It's at Arrowhead. Uh, and when you were on the show last time here, you were saying Tyreek who? So I ask you now, do you still feel the Chiefs offense um, is okay without Tyreek? Let me tread lightly because I think he saw the show. <laughs> of course he because did. Because he sent out a treat and threw a little shade back at me on my birthday. So What did he uh, say? Yeah, uh, he said I was the second greatest returner oh. in Chiefs history. Happy birthday to the half, the second greatest returner. <laughs> so I, you, I was you, like, you yeah, had he it saw coming. the show. You had it coming, yeah, babe. Sorry. Definitely. Definitely. But um, we definitely, we definitely are missing the cheetah. Um, as far as the explosive plays. But I think it's making Patrick Mahomes become a more well-rounded quarterback, which is crazy to say because he was already, in my mind, a phenomenal top-tier quarterback, the best in the league right now. But I think we're seeing a, a, a maturation of, of how much further he can develop and be because he doesn't have the cheetah. So yeah. we won't get the explosive plays like we used to, but we're now going to methodically move down the field uh, with this group of guys. Do the Raiders have a chance? Of course not. Of course not. They haven't beaten the Chiefs in about 10 years, it feels like. I think they would. Or not, the last... It's not good. It's, it's not, not good. good. So, no chance. In Arrowhead, Monday night? Are you kidding me? Yeah. No chance. They just got to stop. I mean, Josh Jacobs turned it on last week, so he could maybe... Yes, he did. He's, they got to stop him, of course, but... 
I mean, we, we've seen two different Chiefs teams the past couple of weeks, right? One that wasn't prepared and had a lot of time to do it against the Colts, but Colts seem to be their kryptonite. They seem to do okay against the Raiders. So I didn't think that you would uh, ask any different. Is there an X factor for tonight on either side? Yes. Um, for the Chiefs, I think it's Isaiah Pacheco. I really wow. love this kid. Yeah, Isaiah Pacheco, number 10. Um, he's a beast. I look at his attributes and what he gives us on special teams, returning kicks, what he gives the Chiefs um, on offense as far as his tough inside running. Clyde Hiller Edwards is a great utility back. He can do a little bit of everything. But I think Pacheco gives us a dominant, very uh, forceful running game, which opens up everything for Patrick Mahomes. Chiefs, like fans, Chiefs fans are loving every second of this right now. We got to tweet that out immediately. Isaiah Pacheco, the X Factor in tonight's yes, action. Sir. Dante, have fun, take pictures, enjoy the barbecue, and we will hopefully talk to you soon. Yes, of course. Go and cheese. Cheetah. Cheetah, stop being mean. Stop being mean to Dante. <laughs> off. Oh, yeah, we'll Kate. be back right here on Up and Adam Show to shut it down. Oh. One of our staff members' cousins was at the game. Back on Up and Adams, Eagles everywhere. You made all the difference tonight. I don't recognize Nick Sirianni without a visor, but I recognize all those Eagles fans who traveled well to the desert, home of the Super Bowl, where they very well might be playing in a couple of months. That's right, the Eagles undefeated. They are doing their thing. Uh, and I really don't know what's next. I believe we have a tweet. That we have to show? Is this true? I don't quite know. I don't have any any direction. So here we go. The we oh, here's the direction. We found a map to the ultimate Philly fan. Now I'm told, I don't know the story. Sometimes I don't get filled in on everything. Um, I know Marissa was in Arizona. I heard this is your cousin. Is this, is this a joke or no? <laughs> is this not your cousin? It's probably my seventh cousin. Can Everyone's I see the photo again? Everyone's related in Philly. This is dedication. Rob Dunphy. The man. Why do you know his name? He's a Philadelphia icon. Is he? If there's a Mount Rushmore, he definitely would be on it. He's got 95. <laughs> best highway ever. Why is it the best? Because he have the, bec the best um, uh, Wawa's? What do you mean? Like, why, <laughs> why is it the best highway ever? It connects everything. It's been under construction since the day I've been born. Okay. And it still will be until I die. Probably. Are you nervous about your record? Or are you excited? I'm, I'm nervous. I. I you know, we're always a little pessimistic. I, I'm not used Marissa to this. Marissa can't hear anything. Marissa just keeps talking off air.